Um, good. Thanks very much for coming, everybody. Yeah, I'd like to say thank you too. It's a long time since I've been in New York, so um, yeah, it's nice to come back here. So I'm John. This is Ron. Yep. Um, and uh, we're delighted to be here. It's um, really nice to be able to participate in Independent Venue Week. Um, this is a slightly unusual um, setup, I guess, for Independent Venue Week, but really nice to be able to, to do this. And we've got some music later on, so half an hour of talking, more or less, and then about an hour of, um, of Sheffield-inspired music for you to listen to. Um, so we've decided we're going to do this as a, as a bit of a conversation. So Ron, Ron was, was there uh, in the... Um, in amongst, the, in amongst it the from she the 70s Sheffield music scene so um, I've yeah. got a few questions I want to ask Ron and I think Ron's got a few questions that he wants to ask me about why I'm interested in all this stuff yeah. um, but uh, just to start off by introducing ourselves oh I should say also thanks to the Vinyl Cafe for hosting this as well yeah. These, um, as I say it's not, not a typical IVM um, uh, event but it's, it's really great to have this, have this format and it's always lovely to come back here third time I think I've done something like this here so it's really nice to have this opportunity and uh, thanks Dom for providing the platform for, for this. Um, so I'm uh, John Schofield, I'm in the archaeology department at the University of York and I'm interested in music and heritage um, so that's why I'm here. Yeah I'm uh, Ron Wright, I also work in a university, Sheffield Hallam University, I teach on a film and media production course, it's now also called film and TV production course because we're transitioning to to a new kind of model. And um, what I do there is I teach sound. So, uh, well, that would be sound recording, sound design. And I'm quite... I was in a band in Sheffield called Hula. We're going to be um, hearing Hula later. Oh, right. Those of you, okay. those of you who hang around. Uh, and it's Ron's vocal, by the way, that you're oh, hearing. Oh, right, OK. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, I'll probably make a swift exit before that. And... Um, yeah, and I, I was in a band called Hula, and uh, I arrived in Sheffield in 1975 to go to Sheffield University, where I did English literature. Um, yeah. Now, I've got a question immediately about <laughs> right, that. Okay. So when you came, so you, you're not from Sheffield, you probably tell from no. his accent. Yeah. So when you went to Sheffield, yeah. you told me that it was like going somewhere... And it wasn't Sheffield. What was the name? What was the place that you said it was like arriving? Right. At? I'll tell you the context of tell that. us the story. That, um, I was being interviewed for um, a DVD called um, the, uh, the Industry Industrial Music for the Urban Decay by a woman called Emily Rabinac from Australia, and it was about. I think we were interviewed because. They were running out of time, and I was interviewed at about eight thirty in the morning or something in a in a hotel. We went to their hotel room and they put a light on us, and, and they said, um, "When you came to Sheffield, it must have been. How did you find it? Because it's very grim, and you know." And uh, I said, "Well, I, you know, I come from a little coal mining town in the northeast, and Sheffield." <laughs> Sheffield to me was brilliant. I said to John, it was like coming to Hawaii after, <laughs> after where I lived. And, um, and funnily enough, the band was called Hula, which had a kind of Hawaiian name. And we're probably, um, that's a problem, because if you look for our name or try to find our work, you often have to skip through about 20 Hawaiian bands to get to us. So, um, so yeah, that, that was the story behind that. So... So worth just digging into that a little bit more. So going yeah. into Sheffield at yeah. that time. So what was, I mean, obviously we, we, we're going to talk about bands like Cabaret Voltaire, Human League, yeah. and people like that, yeah. and Hula, yeah. emerging out of this industrial backcloth, if you like, yeah. in the early to mid-1970s. So what was Sheffield like at that time? You described it as being a bit, what did you say, grim? Is that the word you used? Well, that's what, Pete, there was the phrase, wasn't it? It's grim up north, but... Um, to be honest, I've all, when I came to Sheffield, I was in quite a nice area. And um, I actually do like a lot of my work that I do, and I'm interested in, is industrial landscape and cities in transformation. And I think there's a great beauty in some of those old buildings, and we'll mention some like Forge Masters later, and a lot of them are in a region called Callum Island. And... Um, and also, uh, the, the weird thing is, Sheffield 
was a very heavy manufacturing city, the steel industry was huge. But it's a kind of dichotomy that Sheffield also has, is probably the greenest city in definitely the UK, probably Europe, in terms of woodland area, because we're annexed to the Peak District. And there's many parks in the city. So it's actually, and it, it, I find it very chilled. And to be honest, for me, coming from the Northeast, I hadn't even seen in that Chinese food <laughs> at all. So it was, it was kind of a, a discovery, a journey of discovery in many ways. And uh, I felt like Christopher Columbus when I went home. And my family would be, oh, tell us about those meals you do, <laughs> like chili con carne <laughs> and spaghetti bolognese, you know. So, um, so yeah, it, uh, I, and I, I've lo- I, I love the city, and um, it it opened up to me, and I'll maybe talk about that a little bit later. And I find it quite chilled, and I think as well, because it's not got the bustle of the largest cities, there's a kind of space there, so people can get on and think and do things. And um, so I think it's quite good for those who want to kind of pursue creative, creative kind of mm. creative work. And what was happening to the steel industry at this time? Right, well... Was, um, this, was this the point of transition when it... Was this the point of decline? Yeah, I think so. I think that what was happening was that Sheffield between the 50s and... From the 50s to the 70s... I mean, it was known as the People's Republic of Sheffield, and there was this kind of um, striving towards a kind of ideal social state, which was based on being fair. So, you know, when I when I lived there, um, bus fares were virtually nothing. I remember I I used to ask for ten because. They couldn't understand me if I said eight because I couldn't, I couldn't pronounce it properly, you know, in terms of how they'd understand it. And I think, um, um, just trying to think, I think what happened was that the steel industry was closing down, and so you know, then that led to more unemployment, and maybe that would be one of the reasons as well why music. There's a phrase that was coined by a band called I'm So A Hollow, and um, it's called Dreams To Fill The Vacuum. And I think that was the, t- well, I know, that was the title of a cherry red um, compilation of Sheffield that came out about a year ago. And I think that's what Richard Kirk as well said. Richard Kirk was, um, I think, one of the seminal influences of, of Sheffield. He, he was very forward-looking, a visionary. Um, and he just said, you know, it was kind of, there was nothing to do. So, um, so a so combination of that yeah. and these new spaces that were available, a little bit like in Berlin with the end, you know, with the wall coming down and creating these, yeah, and these I, urban spaces that were available I, for people that, to use. That's absolutely right. And I think that now a lot of cities are modelling on Berlin because uh, there's a lot of town centres that are being transformed, so they have to go through rundown fairs. What happened in Sheffield was that um, obviously the steel industry was, um, you know, was the main thing in the city. So there was all these little workshops called the Little Masters, and what they were were um, they were crafts people who were aligned to the major manufacturing industry. So what they were doing was um, kind of. Um, it would be like making cutlery, so there, there, I went to two of the little master's workshops that were still going about 12, 15 years ago, and they were about the only two who were still uh, working, and what they were doing was making um, instruments for, for surgeons, and it would be things like to uh, prize out a hip bone or something, you know. Um, so it was to do with medical tools, and it was all precise work. And what happened was that um, as those workshops, those little you know, blacksmiths and um, smaller kind of industrial units became unoccupied, what happened was that all the artists, and this is round about the time of, well, we're talking in the late 70s, when punk had started, 
And um, what Punk did, and there was a there's a DJ called uh, Parrot in Sheffield, and when I interviewed him, he said that what it did was, Punk, was it, it gave people, um, it made it possible for non-musicians and artists to kind of become musicians, if you like, or to start doing things that were music or, or you know, something similar to that. And um, and when I think about it, and I've said that the, the craftspeople, how they kind of buffed and polished things, and that's kind of what was happening in Sheffield in the way that we worked. And if I can explain a little bit, um, I, I know, for example, what I used to do and what I was very interested in was um, making tape loops, so where you get a tape recorder. And if you, there, it was pre-sampling. So in those days, um, you know, if you wanted to create some sort of beat or whatever, you might record it into a tape recorder, cut it to a loop and play it. And we were looking at things like Gogo that was out at the time, all sorts of electro phrase out as kind of like an electro loop. Mm -hmm. And we would play on top of that. And so all it was a bit like the Little Mester's production line where you're kind of buffing and burnishing and shaping and making things. And uh, so it wasn't just that you got your guitar out and started playing. And I think one thing as well that um, democratised that whole kind of idea of music and for people who weren't musicians was, for me, things like the recording Walkman. Because what was happening was we were recording things, news items, all sorts, sound bites, and they were being filtered into the music. They'd become part of the music. So that, and then later when computers like the Atari ST came out, don't know if anyone remembers <laughs> an Atari ST, and I mean, that was fantastic. And suddenly you didn't need to be a brilliant musician. You didn't need to have to spend lots of money to go to a studio. You do it in your bedroom or anywhere. And I, so, yeah, it's really it was a great it's, enabler, it's, wasn't it? Yeah, it's, and it's, it's, a, it's a continuation of that industrial yeah. tradition. It's, I mean, as an archaeologist, I think of this as the kind of, it's like the new, a new industrial archaeology, if you like. And if you're telling the industrial, if you're representing the industrial archaeology of Sheffield, there's that earlier phase, yeah. and then there's something much more recent, which uses the spaces and many of the techniques that were used you know, in the in that first phase as yeah, well. Yeah, and steel it, it's got fun. a quote about that as well, actually. Yeah, do you want so, to? Yeah, this yeah, is from uh, Deborah Egan. So I should also say, Ron and I wrote a paper about this, which some of you may have seen, but if you haven't seen it and you'd like to, it's open access, so I can share it mm -hmm. um, with you afterwards. You can contact me on social media and I can just share, you, share the link with you. Um, but as part of that paper, part of the research that led to that paper, um, Ron conducted some interviews with some of these people who were involved in the music scene. Um, and one of those interviews, I've got two actually, I can just give you quickly. One was Deborah Egan. Who was Deborah Egan? Just tell us who okay, Deborah, Deborah Egan was. Deborah Egan, um, I think, came to Sheffield at the age of five. Her father used to drum in Ronnie Scott's, and I think he got like a permanent job in Sheffield. And he was the mentor, I believe, for Tony Oxley, uh, who was part of a very free form jazz movement in the 60s in Sheffield. Because when I was talking to Deborah and saying, oh, you know, 70s was great, she was saying, no, it goes back earlier than that in mm. terms of trailblazing and um, and Sheffield apparently had a really vibrant and acclaimed uh, freeform jazz mm. jazz scene so she then um, she she was given an honour I don't know if it was an MBE I can't remember OBE but she got that about two years ago and she's um, she's pioneered digital arts in Sheffield so I think she was our manager yeah. briefly but she was certainly someone who <laughs> kind of facilitated for yeah. us okay. and she runs a, an arts uh, an art kind of cafe like this uh, called Dino in Sheffield which okay. I think you've seen right okay well here, this is what she said in 2019 um, what made it different in Sheffield was the electronica and the influence of industrialization and then reflecting what you just said, electronic music mirrors the steel industry because it's studio-based and involves burnishing, cutting, polishing, editing, and it's the same as the metal-making factory process. So it's, yeah. that, it's that, exactly that point about all these various techniques yeah. that you were talking about, which go back to that earlier tradition. Um, and then we've got Richard Barrett. Parrot. Um, that's Parrot. That's Parrot, who yeah. you were talking about. 
um, which is about the workshops as well. And, and Richard Barrett said, um, part of the same uh, interview process that Ron conducted, uh, the tradition of small independent workshops servicing the steel industry, the little mesters, um, perhaps could have led to a certain independence of spirit. Also, freedom of thought could have been influenced by the prevalence of non-conformist chapels in the area during the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries. So that's another angle on this and where mm -hmm. this, this fierce sort of sense of independence might, might come from and what makes Sheffield perhaps different. It's worth... Yeah. I mean, I wanted to ask you this, actually, th th this thing about Sheffield being different because, of course, in the mid-1970s, there was a punk scene mm -hmm. emerging very rapidly around the country, mm -hmm. particularly in the urban and suburban areas, um, kicked off arguably by the Sex Pistols and their national tour. Mm -hmm. um, but in Sheffield, it didn't happen like that, did it? And not only did it not happen in the same format with, mm -hmm. you know, four blokes usually, uh, yeah. two guitarists, a drummer and a singer, but, yeah. but with, through electronic music, but also the electronic music actually predated yeah. punk, didn't it? Cabaret Voltaire were around before any of this happened? Yeah, they were, but I think that what happened was there was a number of factors that it became quite a distinctive um, kind of pioneering city in terms of electronic music, which then later was kind of moved from bands into how, uh, the club scene and various things like techno, etc. Um, Baseline which I think is attributed to uh, a little club called Niche, which never got a license. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to the music. And also um, Gatecrusher, which was in Sheffield, the spiritual home of Gatecrusher. And that, you know, there was people coming from London in coaches, in their oak boots and their, um, their neon kind of um, jackets or whatever they were wearing. And, and knowing they probably wouldn't get in, but just wanting to kind of see it, see the place. Mm. Um, and I won't go into it, but I, I actually did. Um, it was it was originally going to be called the Republic, and it didn't get a license because of the Methodist um, kind of the people who approved it were very old Methodists, and they weren't into alcohol or the idea of another club. But anyway, sorry, t take me back to where we started now. I'll, I'll tell you about Sheffield. Um, what did you want to know, was it about? Yeah, the, the, pump, the pump, yeah, and what, yeah, yeah, so, um, scene, yeah. yeah, there was, I'm just trying to think, yes. So the idea in Sheffield was, or the influences were, that um, there was two main bands that came out roughly at the same time. One's the Human League, who you probably know because of, uh, and they were kind of very much a synthesizer band, that's all they played. And that was um, kind of synth pop, if you like. Um, and then there was Cabaret Voltaire. And I think, and Cabaret Voltaire, I think were, um, for me, the biggest influence in Sheffield. They probably um, didn't get the acclaim commercially that other bands have got. And, um, but so what it was, quite simply, was that these, although they started to appear in the 77, they were all germinating in, in attics. They were kind of, you know, just playing around with ideas. And the influences really weren't necessarily music. Uh, there would be, for example, literature. Uh, William Burroughs was hugely influential and that idea of cutting up loops and stuff came from the cut up techniques of William Burroughs, the way he wrote, and Brian Geisen. Um, there was also, um, I'm just trying to think, what they did as well was they didn't have a drummer, which actually was never heard of in, in those days. They didn't have a light show, they played to uh, a film backdrop Human League had Adrian Wright, who, who had slides, um, and they were kind of like pop quiche. And uh, the cabs, it was a little bit darker what they showed. Um, and I remember just watching it and just thinking it was, for me, a bit like film noir or something. It's, and film noir is this idea of what's on the edge of frame that you can't see, and it, it just... For me, really, I found it inspirational because it was hinting at a kind of a higher ground that I'd never seen before or imagined. So, um, 
So yeah, I, I think they were the the two main influences. And in many and, ways. and the, and they but they the the punk is very evident in their attitude and also the the DIY approach. Yeah, as so, well, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it was almost as though Cabaret Voltaire embracing those two things yeah. in 1973 almost predates. I mean, it's almost pre-punk, isn't it? Yeah, in a way. yeah, it was, and I think they were influenced a lot by. Um, kind of what was happening in Germany, mm. um, in, uh, I would say, Detroit, in Philadelphia, the kind of music scenes that, w- that were evolving there. Um, but, the, but the fact that this electronic version of punk, if you like, yeah. it might be too simple, yeah. too simplistic, but stick with it for now. Mm-hmm. The fact that that's happening in Sheffield and nowhere else... Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, that's interesting. And and is is that down to this? I don't know. I'm not sure what it is, but the, but that industrial backdrop and that independent spirit that we've talked about is that what that is, or was it down to the individual, the guy from Cabaret Voltaire, who was so influential? Well, I think I, th- I think the three members of Cabaret Voltaire, Chris Watson was one. You probably know about him because he's uh, the world's kind of most famous wildlife recorder, so he pops up on David Attenborough programs. Um, so he, there was him, there was uh, Stephen Mounder, who I actually lived with for a few years anyway, and he um, he was very in, he, he was really into music and very influenced by lots of different things. Um, I was just going to say he's written one of the most informative theses I've ever seen that, that was for his PhD. Oh, yeah, he did a PhD at and it was Sussex, called, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, Movement Journey of the Beat. Um, Sorry, could you say that again? It was called what? Movement Journey of the Beat, I believe. Sorry, I realise I'm not looking over here. So sorry about that. I can't hear you now, so... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think as well that... Um, the, these bands, you see, like um, the, they were influenced by. Well, I can tell you, it was Roxy Music. They were a huge influence, particularly because of Brian Eno, and the sales of Roxy Music albums were disproportionately high in Sheffield compared to anywhere else. I was a huge Roxy Music fan myself, and still am. You know, because it was just something that was just so. Um, tangential to anything I was used to at all mm. so there was that you know there was um, other influences were things like Clockwork Orange Wendy Carlos who did the electronic soundtrack I can think of the bands that have taken names in Sheffield from uh, Clockwork Orange Heaven 17 that's one um, they're from ex-members of the Human League Martin Moyer was one of them um, there was Durango 95, which is the sports guy. I don't know if you can remember it. And that was a just a local band. Um, I think as well, Heaven 17, Moloko, or Moloko, um, another famous band. So, you know, there was mm. lots of, mm. of influences from... Like I said, it wasn't just music. Mm. It came from a vast array of media. And, and returning to the title of our talk... Yeah. The drop hammer. Okay. So the the, the, you know, the, the steam hammer that, that apparently is the sound that characterised the industry in Sheffield for so many people um, yeah. while the steel industry was still um, yeah. functioning. Um, that's been... I mean, we've got a couple of quotes yeah. about, about that, haven't we, as well, from the, from yeah, the interviews yeah. you conducted. Winston Hazel, um, who said, when the drop hammers are slamming, that's about 60 tonnes bursting out red-hot steel. There's a rhythm to that which then travels up the Don Valley and starts to bounce off everything that it hits. And then he goes on, I was, going to, I was going to sleep to rhythm and beat and sonic, so I'm already alert to it. The other thing that goes with that is the smell. It was a very grimy city, use term you used earlier on. Toxic air, and you get that smell of hot molten steel as well. And all those things that you associate with a sound and vice versa, and they never leave you. So that's, yeah. that's Winston Hazel talking about that influence, but he's not the only... Sheffield musician to have made that point that that sound, that yeah. resonant sound that yeah. just kept people awake at night yeah. um, was really influential You could say that Sheffield I mean I'm taking huge licence here is a little reverberation unit because it's built on seven hills 
So, you know, these things, are, these sounds are bouncing around, mm. if you like. Mm. And I, I didn't hear it so much. Um, I know people have. When I was researching um, the, the chapter we wrote, I was reading about people, um, you know, in, the, in like the 60s and 70s, and what's that sound? And, um, and people would say, oh, yeah, that's the hammers that are... You know, blah blah, and this this part, like say, bring it back or something like that. And um, I think it would shake people in their beds if you were near enough. And of course, it'd be going through the night mm. because pubs for steel workers would be open from like seven in the morning or mm. something because people would just need to hydrate, if you like, you know. And in the true DIY spirit, there was yeah. the rumor that Cabaret Voltaire made a made a, a synthesizer to replicate the sound of the drop hammer. Do, I think do you know if that's I, I, myth th- or is there's that... an infa- infamous um, tale about them playing a gig at the University of Sheffield. Uh, it was for some, oh God, I can't remember now, but it was some event, almost like a seminar. And um, they used the, a tape loop of a drop hammer. Uh, and apparently I think it might have come from Belgium, but... But they annoyed the audience so much. I think Richard Kirk had fairy lights on his jacket. And this is mid-70s, you know. And, uh, and um, you know, what they were playing, it was, it was just too, too unconventional. And so the band attacked, the crowd attacked the band. And I think Mal ended up in hospital with a chipped, uh, kind of, he chipped a bone in his spine. Um, so it's all the stuff of legend, you know, yeah. but it's great. So, um, yeah. Talking of the stuff of legend, okay. I feel I should, I feel I need to ask you about your um, Peel sessions. So you did, with Hula, you did some John Peel did, sessions, yeah. didn't you? Uh, um, so, yeah. I, awesome. You told me, so there were two stories you told me. One yeah. was <laughs> how uh, John Peel contacted you. So do you want to start with... Yeah. Start with that uh, That was... Um, we hadn't even got a record out or anything. And, um, you know, we were... Um, what we were doing was quite unconventional in a way. And we used to rehearse in a cellar in a house that was called the Hula Cooler. And it dated back to the 1600s, I believe. And apparently it was the only house in the whole region of Hillsborough, Walkley. And... It might have belonged to the Duke of Clarence, I can't remember. It was haunted, and I do believe it was. There was real tales about this haunted house. But it was a house that, when it came to be sold, it's now a nursery. Um, There was people coming in and saying, "Uh, we don't want to buy it, but we just want to come in. There were some great parties we enjoyed there. Joe Cotter was a, a frequent visitor. It was, I think, often in the front page of the little paper for drug busts. Um, You know, it was, when I moved in, it was kind of a gay house. And it was moving, you know, just it kind of, it it was a house with a history. So um, we probably sent John Peel a cassette of rehearsing in the garage. And I got a call one night, it was about 10.30, and I just picked it up, I was the only one in the house and, you know, it was high in it, so it's, it's Ron Wright then. I was like, yeah, it's me, it's, it's John Peel here. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and uh, he's like, yeah, 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 I just want to say that I got your tape, like, cassette, I, I really like it. Um, God knows what it sounded like, you know. And he just said, um, look, when I'm doing my show, um, I, I, because I get so many cassettes mailed to me, I don't have time to reply so in writing. So when I'm playing records, I try and phone around people and, you know, talk to them and say thank you. And, you know, what a great guy to mm. do that. And mm. we did three Peel sessions for, for, well, three sessions for John Peel. I mean, you don't see him because you go to Maidervale Studios and you have to knock out some tracks, four tracks in a day. Um, and normally there's a producer there and I'm going to tell you this because you know it in one session we did and um, the producer had gone to the pub as they do and they just come back at the end to make sure that you've kind of done your four tracks and we were running out of time and we had about five, ten minutes and they were like, well, what are you going to do? So, all right, okay. So we put a drone on. I think it was called Gun Culture. It's got a bit of William Burroughs saying something like, um, I won't say what it was. Um, 
And we said, we'll throw some percussion around the room, and you know, because they had mic set up. So we were doing that. And uh, it was Mike Robinson, I think he's now, and he came in, he's like, he's probably a bit drunk. He's like, oh, right, you're throwing percussion around the room. Marvellous. <laughs> you know? It's like, okay, then good. So that was track number four, <laughs> done and dusted in five minutes. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, and so we're very lucky to do three sessions. Mm. I met him on other occasions. He's very shy, actually, really shy. He was awarded an honorary doctorate at home, and I was asked to present it to him. And I tried to make a joke to him, but he was just, he was as terrified as I am now, you know. So, <laughs> so yeah, but a lovely guy. Mm. Yeah. And Hula still going? Um, yeah, we're creaking along. I think that um, we we weren't going, and then I met the drummer um, who has a studio, and we just got talking and said, "Yeah, let's do some. Why don't we do some stuff?" And we've got quite a few tracks which we'll probably never finish. And I'm still doing music anyway. And um, so when I say music, I don't really count myself. I'm a, I mean, I've got a sense of music. I'm not an accomplished mu musician. I've always been more interested in those weird noises that you can find and make and things like that. But, yeah, I, you know, I, I find it very um, cathartic and mm, delight mm. to do that thing. But sorry, John, I've not kind of asked you anything about why, as an archaeologist, <laughs> you are here now talking about yeah. music. Yeah, yeah, it's a good. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, I, I'm. I've made it my mission for a number of years now to sort of take archaeology in directions that, you know, perhaps shouldn't go, or some people think it shouldn't go, and I'm just r really interested in sort of exploring the boundaries a little bit, the fuzzy bits around the edge, or whatever you yeah, said earlier yeah, on about yeah. the, <laughs> about your video screens. Um, but for me, yeah, I mean, for me, what I what I do with you in Sheffield is is archaeology. When we've been out in the city and we've wandered around, yeah. looking at empty spaces and some not empty spaces where people are still working on music production, that's an archaeological approach because it's it's the it's it's physical things, it's material culture, it's the artifacts, the objects, and the way people interact with them in a space. And that's just as true from you know 1980s Sheffield or whatever mm -hmm. as it is for. Um, you know, five thousand year old Neolithic Britain or something. It's, just, it's exactly the same. You ask exactly the same questions about about the ways people interact with the world okay. around them. Um, so yeah, that's my that's my answer to that question. And some people like that answer, and some people don't like that answer. As I've noticed, <laughs> so to be that doesn't bother me, of uh, course. But, um, but the other, but, uh, yeah. what I was going to say, the other thing is, um, you know, with regard to. How do you consider music as part of heritage and its importance? Yeah, I think I find that a question easier to answer because right. because it's about the continued use of, of these spaces and these buildings, which are historic buildings after all. A lot of these are, are former, well, they're, they're, they're current industrial buildings, but they have a previous industrial life, if you like. Um, and, of course, there's a, there's a, let's call it a prehistory to those buildings as well. There was a time when those factories didn't exist either and there was something else there um, just in the same way that the Park Hill Estate um, flats in Sheffield that many of you will be familiar with mm -hmm. used to be a deer park historic mm -hmm. deer park and before that it was something else so the world changes yeah. and heritage is about interpreting that change and understanding that change and so now those, those buildings that we visit together and that we've mm -hmm. been sort of talking about mm -hmm. kind of places where you used to rehearse the, the mm -hmm that manor house or whatever it was, and, and the industrial spaces where um, music is made in Sheffield today, um, and the attic where Cabaret Voltaire used to make their music, those are all historic spaces um, uh, which still exist in most cases. Yeah. So it's, a, it's about how we interpret those places and understand them, and what we, what we want to do with them in the future as well, whether we want them to remain, whether we want them to change, whether we want them to remain unchanged, or whether we're happy to let them go. I think um, that's quite contentious in terms of there's a, 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 a kind of contentious, it was Adam Morris actually who was the manager for the Orb and he lives in Sheffield now and he was bemoaning the fact that, um, you know, what happens is that people move into these industrial spaces, kind of claim them and they become trendy 
and then the property developers move in and then they shunt it further out. And the one area that's still roughly in the city centre, just outside of it, next to Bramall Lane actually, is Stag Works, which is a huge kind of complex of rooms with a courtyard. I mean, really run down, but occupied by musicians such as Arctic Monkeys and Adam Morris was saying, look at how many millions they've earned. And this isn't necessarily against the Arctic Monkeys, but you know, shouldn't that be retained because ultimately it'll become flats or something. Mm. And it seems a shame when it's got so much history attached to it. Um, so that's that's one thing that we feel is, you know, it's a, it's a problem mm. that, that actually there's no consideration of that really mm. when it comes to town planning. Yeah, often. sure, yeah. Okay, let's play some music. Um, and then... <laughs> Thank you, John, by the way. Um, small crowd, but thank you very much for your attention and for asking some great questions.